Hello, I'm Gwyneth Jones of the Translator Studio. We specialise in teaching the art of translation and in preparing translators for professional translation exams like the DipTrans. In this video, I interview Ross Edwards, an up-and-coming translator and copy editor and one of our former students. Ross talks about starting out as a translator by transitioning from learning Spanish into learning how to translate and how to improve his writing skills. He mentions how he subtitled for TED before he began getting paid translation work. Ross has some great insight on the importance of using feedback and of mastering the art of translation to ensure a steady workflow. He emphasises the diverse skill set translators develop and how he doesn't see machine translation as a threat. His thoughts will be useful for people starting out and for experienced translators. Translators, I give you Ross Edwards. Ross, tell us how you got into translation. Yeah, so I had quite a career crisis when I left university and about a year after I left university, I started learning Spanish because I'd met a Spanish uh, lady. And Good motivation. It was, yeah. And when COVID hit, so that was two years ago, when COVID hit, I'd been learning for a year and a half, something like that. And... I, I sort of got forced into the situation of not working just because of the nature of the work I was doing at the time. And I'd heard people talking about translation. I'd heard people talking about working freelance. And I was really into, I was going through sort of the big Spanish learning period at the time when you're all excited and all that. And you're learning, you seem to be learning really quickly, picking it up. So I thought, right, this is a perfect opportunity to just explore translation and see if I could make a career out of it. And I'd always, I'd, all, I'd sort of got in touch at that point with a, a desire to write and a desire to be created, creative using writing as well. And I think that also had an influence because it's obviously a huge part of the, of the job. So yeah, that's when I came and started doing your courses, Gwen. Mm -hmm. Started with the conversion course. And over the next year, I've not officially finished the advanced course yet, but more or less over the next year or so, I'd, I did those pretty religiously. I did those quite regularly and I saw a big learning spike. And also just after COVID came, so when I was sort of inspired to start translating, I looked for translation opportunities on the internet because I had quite a lot of free time on my hands because of the COVID situation. And that's when I found TED. Mm -hmm. And I think I spent about eight months at TED. They, they sort of transitioned to a new platform and it never sort of, it took a long time for that to happen. And by that, by the time they'd gone back, I uh, had found paid work. So I didn't go back, but I was there for eight months. I got a lot of very close one-to-one -one training that, I was quite taken aback by, to be honest, by the level, considering that these people are all volunteers. And I got to collaborate on dozens of videos, dozens of TED Talks. So that yeah, was really great. This is, I interviewed, there's a separate interview with Matt about this subject. I'll link to it under the video. And there's a guest post on our site. I know that you helped Matt when he got started. He, meant, he mentioned you. Um, so for anyone who's interested, I'd check out those links. Um, he also talked about this, this kind of idea that you get a mentor, which is a more experienced person, and that the feedback loop that they have going there is, is, I think, quite exceptional, because as a general rule, you hear people saying, I didn't get enough feedback. Oh, yeah. I mean, in my experience with agencies, people just want to, well, I don't know what their motives are, but it seems like they just want to write, a, write something because they have to write something, and then they just want to get on with the next project or whatever it is so yeah it was very it was exceptional yeah it was 
And I was actually being taught, I wasn't just being, like, I was actually being taught about subtitling, about house, house style, punctuation, you know, Spanish, English, everything, localization, a lot of stuff, really, looking back. That's great. But you've managed to start getting some paid work. So how did that come about? Well, you recommended me, actually, for the first agency that I started with. Okay, that's <laughs> that's great. <laughs> uh, nice coincidence. Nah, yeah, that. so that was about a year ago. So that was a recommendation. And, yeah, it's been... It's been an interesting experience, yeah. Doing marketing, translation, financial translation, that kind of thing. And what has been your favourite translation project so far? Yeah, the the favourite one for me so far hasn't actually been a paid one. And it's Mm -hmm. not that the paid ones haven't been good, but (laughs) it's just that I knew someone through... I knew someone that worked for an organization that I was part of for a little while. And they they have sort of a Spanish branch to it. And so, you know, they don't have a huge budget or anything like that. So I did some uh, free translations for them. And that was really fun because it was, you know, it was a genuine interest of mine. I felt like I was contributing something just out of, the, just out of my own goodness. And so it was nice to offer that. Mm-hmm. given the knowledge and experience that I'd picked up. That's there's brilliant. actually quite a lot of that on the internet. I know that you can do, yeah, there's a lot of organizations that just want people to volunteer as translators. Yeah, if you can share any of them with me after the interview, I'll put links to them and under the video. Yeah. There's a We've got a guest post on the blog by Rana Shabibi about working for Translators Without Borders, which is one of the big ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I know that there are others out there and we're happy to put links to them. If we can get enough together, we'll put a blog post out um, with with a list of them. And what about on the downside? Can you tell us about a bad experience related to your work that has helped you to do things better? Yeah, so with this agency that I'm working with, the client, everything seemed to be fine. You know, the project managers were giving good feedback. They were happy. They were sending the translations off without much extra editing or corrections. And, well, basically the, the client wasn't, the client wasn't, they felt that our translation could be improved, essentially. So, I mean, it wasn't, a, that's not a major issue, but that was quite early on. And I was, I was doing a lot of the translations at the time. And so that, the um, responsibility sort of fell on me. And I thought, well, I'm just, I've just started off here. Why am I getting the uh, responsibility? But Mm -hmm. I think it was good for me because it helped me really think more about what was actually happening because the client wasn't happy with the way we'd written the articles for their specific needs. And it was really the sort of the tone that we were putting in. And I, I realized that, you know, as a translator, if you're working freelance, especially when you're not surrounded by people in an office and you've not got people coming and going from other companies, client companies, it's, it can be easy to sort of (laughs) enclose yourself in your own little translation world and not think about what's actually happening to that work. And for me, that's been one of the big lessons is to really think about what is the purpose of the translation? What, who's actually going to read it? uh, What, what's it trying to achieve what's the text trying to achieve and what does the client actually want and that it's helped me broaden my linguistic um horizons as well because it forces you to be more creative in what you're writing yeah also to to turn your hand to different writing styles and different clients because i think it happens to everybody at some point in the career one client wants it a certain way some clients want it more literal and they'll come back you know, if, if you get too, too creative or too almost too idiomatic for them, they'll come back, why isn't this translation? Why doesn't this say exactly what the, the source text says? And then in the same, maybe working for the same agency, another client comes back complaining the reverse. We wanted this to be a freer translation. We've given this to a native speaker who perhaps didn't know anything about translation or didn't speak the source language. And they've said that it's it can be improved. Um, and so... It is a natural part of the process. And as you're describing, we're here at the end. 
it's not like we're even communicating directly with the client. Yeah. And so it's about the agency being good and the agency getting this brief and communicating, which doesn't often happen. And I agree with you. You've got to take it every single one of them as a learning experience and it just makes you more aware, okay, this can happen. And yeah, the one thing yeah. I would one thing I was going to say is that it's it's really good to create feedback mechanisms with your project managers and your colleagues. And one way I've done that is that I've I've used other people's translations as a learning for myself, like almost like a mini course or a mini lesson, if you like. And I've actually made it my, even if it means that I'm sacrificing words per hour or <laughs> I'm making my mission to provide really good feedback, like positive feedback and neg negative feedback to my colleagues. And then hopefully that sort of stirs up a, a feedback mechanism where everyone's pulling in and giving each other the strengths that they have and what they notice that you <laughs> yourself don't notice. That's a brilliant idea. Yeah, have different eyes and explaining so that because the other thing that can happen, particularly, I mean, I know it happens as a student um, with our feedback where we give you all this feedback and you go, no, I did terribly. But that's a student teacher relationship. So you're expecting it. But it can come across as a bit aggressive when a, co a colleague, a faceless colleague has proofread your work and it's come back with all these corrections and it can make you you worry does this make me look bad in the eyes of the client and so i think you're you're onto something there giving a bit of an explanation to show the why behind these changes rather than just sort of slapping someone in the face with with the corrections yeah, and it's 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 easier when you've you've already worked on many translations with the same people as well but mm -hmm. i think the I'd have to ask them as well, but I think the way I provide feedback isn't like that. It's not a slap in the face. It's just, mm -hmm. look, we're, we're improving translators and we're improving writers and we all have different strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So let's use them. So thinking about up upcoming translators, two of the main concerns that people say to me when they're looking at doing our courses and that when they're thinking about qualifying, maybe doing the dip trans, is that they're worried about not getting enough work and they're also worried about the threat of machine translation. And I wondered what, what you'd say to that. Yeah, there's a couple of points that I want to say is that the, to me in the early days, it should just be about mastering the craft. Um, I'm not saying you don't look for projects, but I'm saying be really professional in what you do and take feedback and make sure that you're actually using that feedback to improve your translation and really focus on just becoming like a, a master of the craft. And I think once you get to that point, like if you look at people who are genuinely very, very good in any field, but translation, you know, the, the work, the work comes to you eventually and you probably won't be struggling for work too much. That's just how I've, that from the people that I know, like I think said. that's that's great advice. It's also similar to something I spoke to Greg earlier, which is another of our students who who's in this series of interviews, and he said something very similar to you there. So, so that's great to hear. I'm not just making it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've also spoken to agency owners, and they'll, and I've I've heard that kind of complaint where they're saying we've got lots of work. What we can't find are good freelancers who are producing the standard of work that we want. And so that also supports what you're saying coming the other way. Yeah, no, I, I think it's like that. And also to develop, be a sort of a business person. This is something that I'm really focusing on recently is to, as a freelancer, you have to, unless you've got people that are helping you and they're taking charge of it for you, or you have some other way. Imagine, especially in the early days, you're probably going to have to, you know, refine your business skills and make your you know even if you don't like doing it i don't like doing it even now and i've had a little bit more experience with it than i used to is you have to put yourself out there and you have to really you have to sell yourself and you have yes. to say look you're you're paying me this money because of because i am this good mm -hmm. it has to be that practical and that mm, sort of uh, cut and dry you know you have to put your Put what you're offering on the, on the table and make sure that they know what you're offering because as well, they don't see you every day like in the office. 
they don't see you at your work they don't converse with people at, in, uh, over lunch about how the work you're doing you're just you're, you're remote and you have to you have to go to them I think more than you might um, initially want to and that's certainly true in my case that's definitely a skill that I had to work on at the beginning. It wasn't mm. easy for me either initially to just put yourself out there and, you know, follow up with people and all of that. I think it is something you practice and it becomes easier the more times you do it. The more times you hear no, it becomes easier to hear no. <laughs> Although hopefully exactly. then with practice you hear you don't yes. Need, you don't need a hundred yeses though. You just need a few and you'll be fine. I'd and also say as well, sorry, were you going to say something? No, no, go ahead, finish. Well, so recently I've actually created a website and I'm lucky because I've spent quite a lot of time on websites on WordPress. And so I managed to create a website in just a few hours. It's nothing overly complicated. It's something quite simple, but it looks professional. And I've noticed even, I created what, two weeks ago, I've noticed people like agencies are, you know, there's a lot more interest now. They're, they're clicking. Have you got Google Analytics so you can see they're clicking in and checking? I've not it out. been looking at it in that much depth, but I, I've just I know just by the emails I'm getting and that it's helping. That's really yeah, interesting. No, definitely, definitely. Um, get, give us a link to it and we'll put it in the in the interview notes so that people can check it out. And what about the other part of the question about machine translation? Have you got any thoughts on that with a with an eye to the future? Well, you know, I'm I'm still an upcoming translator but from what I've seen just from my work with agencies from seeing their marketing and so on looking at their websites and even from clients is that or sort of direct clients is that people agencies don't want agencies actually they sort of advertise human translation to potential clients and it's like a selling point especially if it's technical work that a machine might you know, it might expose the weaknesses of the of the technology. Mm-hmm. And they need someone who actually knows what's happening there in mm-hmm. depth. And so, yeah, I think the more specialized you are, the less you have to worry about that. And yeah. even if, say, in the future, you know, it's all done by robots or whatever in this sort of hypothetical situation, you know, translations are very, well, I think translators are very, very sort of underrated skill, but in includes a lot of other skills that often are just single jobs for people. Like it's just one, your job is a proofreader or a copy editor and that's it. But mm. translation includes a lot of different skills. And even if that were to be the case, you've got a lot of skills under your belt that you can use in other areas, even as a linguist. So yeah, I, I tend not to get swept away by these big negative, you know, stories about how everything's going to collapse i don't i just don't believe in those things so i'm the other, optimistic the other factor there is um what you what you touched on earlier where it's about becoming excellent at your craft because the within the machine translation pro- projects where the ro- role of the translator is as a post editor it isn't easy and i think you've done been studying some editing and done some editing work as well it isn't easy to edit well and So translators who are excellent at their craft Mm. are naturally going to be the best post-editors producing the most natural post-edited text. Well, that's another thing. That's It's another specialization is post-editing. So, yeah, there's these things always create opportunities as well. You know, they they can sometimes change how things have always worked, but then new technology always creates new opportunities as well. And so, Russ, just to close the interview, what would be your message to translators who are where you were a year or so ago? Yeah, one thing that was really that I'd really say is important is to really take feedback seriously from whoever it is you're if you're studying with someone, if you're doing a course, if you're doing a degree or you're working with people or clients is to really take it seriously and yeah really take the lessons and make sure that you're applying what they're saying and listening to them especially if they're much more senior to you and uh, you have to surrender yourself to that and you have to become used to it i think that's that's, really important i agree i think that's brilliant advice it's been a pleasure speaking to you i think you've said a lot of things that'll be really helpful really interesting for upcoming and experienced translators 
So thanks very much for speaking to me, Ross. No problem. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this interview from the Translators Studio. We specialise in teaching the art of translation and in preparing translators for certification through the DipTrans exam. If you like our content, please let us know by clicking on the subscribe button. See you in the next video.